So this morning we're gonna we're gonna for a few moments I'm gonna ask the Lord to help uh, help me because I need His help, Amen. To yeah. to communicate with you, I, I titled this morning's message "Would You Make Him King?" There's a whole lot to this message, and I, maybe in the front end before we even read uh, the story, I had been doing a series on the Book of Romans, uh, Romans chapter six, which I had never really done that on a Sunday morning before, and I believe we're gonna continue it on for a couple of more weeks after. Today, after we're going to enter into Romans chapter 7. I've been doing Romans 6. We're going to enter into Romans 7. And we're going to read this passage out of John where the children of, well, where the inhabitants of Israel, the Israelite people, uh, for a moment in time in this story, they, they wanted to make Jesus king. But what we're going to see in the story is, is that their motives were really skewed and it wasn't really... It looks good on the surface, but the more you begin to understand the Bible, you start to realize that there were some ulterior motives involved in the heart of man. Amen. And is that there are always motives involved in the heart of man that sometimes aren't really completely lining up with the word of the Lord or the will of the Lord. And so that's what we're going to be uh, doing. Let's go ahead and read first verse 15, and then we're going to skip down to verses uh, 25 through 29. So it says... When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Now, I want you to understand a little bit of the background immediate to this story. So we're in John chapter 6 right here. Well, in the previous chapter or even early on here that J Jesus was on a mountain and he was preaching and teaching his disciples, you know, he would teach the multitudes and then he would steal away and he would teach his disciples. And as he's teaching, all of a sudden this multitude comes walking up and Jesus knowing in his heart that they're hungry and they're famished and that they've been, they've traveled a long way. And there's no, you know, there's no uh, cracker barrel store nearby. There's no place to stop. There's no uh, Bucky's truck stop to, to get a hot meal. Jesus knows that. And, and, and he begin, and he questions his disciples, what, what shall we do for them? And, and, and you know, what, how are we going to feed these people? And one of his disciples says, 200 penny worth of denarii would not be enough. And what that means is, is that 200 people's daily wage would not be enough to feed this multitude of people. And so he ends up he ends up multiplying the bread and the fish that this little boy had. That's a whole nother story. But there's this little boy walking around with, with these loaves of fit, bread and these couple of little fish. And all I'm trying to say is, is that he was prepared and ready to be used by the king. He showed up with the little bit that he had. That's a whole nother message right there. And God multiplied it and he used it to feed the multitude. Right? And then whenever it's all said and done, there was fragments, 12 baskets that were picked up from the leftover. And what ends up happening is, is that after this takes place, the people want to, want to make Jesus king. They're like, man, look at this miracle he did. Let's make him king. Well, there's a little bit more to the story. We're going to get into it in a second. And then I want you to see, it says that when they said they were going to make him king, what Jesus does is, is that this says they were going to take him by force to make him a king. He departed again to a mountain by himself. Now, we're going to fast forward a little bit to verse 25. And it says, and when they had found him on the other side. So originally he goes to the mountain alone. And then his disciples shipped over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, Lake Gennesaret, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. He goes to the other side. And, then, and, and so when they found, I'm talking about the crowd... Him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, which means great teacher, when came you here? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracle. Well, hold on a second. I'm so confused because not only did they see it, they ate it, right? They were on the mountain. They saw the bread and the fish multiplied. Not only did they see it, but they touched it they, and they put it in their mouth. If you read it in the Greek, the idea is because you did not properly perceive the miracle. See, God was doing a work through the miracle to open the eyes of the people so that they would be able to see that he is the long-awaited one that they've been waiting for. Now, they, can, they wanted to make him king. And you got to understand, when you and I read the Bible, we may not understand all the intricate details. But the children of Israel were waiting for a descendant of David to come. They were waiting. That's why blind Bartimaeus on the side of the road, whenever he heard the crowd, he cried out. What did he cry out? Son of David, have mercy on me. 
Because he's a blind beggar on the side of the road. But all of Israel knew that the seed of the great King David, because there were prophecies that were going to say that David would come, a root of Jesse, which was David's father. All these various prophecies from Isaiah coming through and telling us that he was still coming all the way back from before David's time. Moses, there would be a prophet like unto me that was going to come. God constantly prophesying to his people that he would come one day. And so they were waiting. See, the, the, the church may not understand all of that because maybe sometimes we haven't been in the faith long, but Israel understood it. And they were waiting for Jesus. They didn't know his name was going to be Jesus, but they knew that Messiah would come. They knew he would be the seed of the woman out of the garden, that he would be the seed of Abraham out of Genesis chapter 12, that he would come from the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, the prophecy that Jacob gives to his sons. They knew that he would come from David, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and they knew these things. They were supposed to know that he'd be the suffering servant, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, but no, they focused on the parts of scripture that they wanted to hear, that he would be the king, and that he would rule from Jerusalem, and that all other nations would be subservient to them. And that's not where they are right here. They're not, all other nations are not subservient to Israel right here in this story with Jesus. No, instead, Israel is subservient to Rome. See, do you like being subservient to people? I don't know if you've ever had a job where you just really didn't like your boss too much. <laughs> you know, you, and you got to, and you got, every day you got to humble yourself and you got to go into work. But the reality is, is this, is that he's the boss. And until, and as a Christian, until God opens up another door and leads you to move on, you're supposed to show up as a Christian and work as unto the Lord. Amen. See, once you get it, once you get saved, all bets are off. You can't just walk up in there with your bad attitude no more. Come on, somebody help me out. This is practical theology. You can't just walk up in there with your bad attitude anymore because your life is not your own. Did you not know that you were bought with a price? Well, what price was I bought with? You were bought with the precious blood of a lamb that was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. God sent his only begotten son to die on a cross for you. Amen. So that you could be saved and now you don't belong to yourself. No, there's a king. Would you make him king? That's the title of this morning. They wanted to make him king, but they wanted to make him king for reasons that they wanted instead of the reasons God wants. See, there's going to be a day when Jesus is going to rule on the throne of David from Jerusalem and all nations will be subservient to him. That's what the word of God says. It's coming. It just isn't here yet. But nevertheless, there's a purpose that God has for Jesus to be king in your heart and in my heart today. And that purpose, I don't want to get ahead of myself in the message, but that purpose is that Jesus would get glory today. God wants Jesus to get glory today. Why? So that others can know him. So that others can come into the faith. You see, it's really about God's will. And many times the masses are so caught up in what they want. Come on, somebody help me. Amen. I'm preaching a lot better. Thank you, Miss Gail. It's great to see you, by the way. We need to make instances to come on. Right? Sometimes we get so caught up in our own will, but, but you don't understand, preacher. I've been waiting for my new car. Well, guess what? If that new car is the object of your faith and your hope and the thing for fulfillment that you're looking for to fill that little God-sized hole in your heart, good luck, my friend, because there's going to be five cars down the road and you still ain't going to be happy. Ain't nothing wrong with having a new car. I done said it too many times. It's getting old. I love the smell of new leather. Ain't nothing wrong with a new car, my friend. Oh, but I want a new house and I deserve it. Ain't nothing wrong with a new house. But if every time you turn a corner, you're looking for something new to make you happy and I'm finally going to find fulfillment. Oh, if you just give me a wife, if you just give me a child, if you just give me a grandchild, if you just give me a new car, if you just give me a house and just give me, give me, give me, because I need something to fulfill me. No, 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 no. You're missing it. You're missing it. They might not preach this down the road. I can't tell them what to preach. All I can tell you is what I see in the word of the Lord. And so many times the people of God miss God's will because they all focused on their own will. Amen. 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 Oh, that's the word right there. That's the word of the Lord. And God, in the same situation going on, they would make him king. They would take him by force and make him king. We're tired of this. We don't like the way this feels. Ain't nobody likes the way right now today feels. Do you like a global pandemic along with a regional 
disaster along with your own personal problems? Come on, somebody help me out here. Ain't nobody likes that. Can I tell you in a little newsflash, the world is fallen. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, it grew thorns and thistles. The word that all creation, according to Romans 8, groans awaiting for the day when the sons of men will be redeemed. What does that mean? I thought we were redeemed. You were. You were redeemed with the blood of the Lamb. Meaning you've been saved. But there's going to, going to be a final right. redemption. Oh, hallelujah. That's going to be a glorious day. See, on the final redemption, the Bible says when we see him, we will be as he is. We're going to receive a glorified body. And the whole creation, listen to me. When you wake up in the morning, you don't have to believe this if you don't want. I'm convinced. I'm convinced of the name of Jesus. I'm convinced of the beauty of his name. And until he shows up in your situation and circumstance, you might not be convinced. But sometimes it takes great pain, great heartache, great circumstance in order for us to be able to become convinced. Amen. And sometimes we've got to run out of looking for other options and come to the place that we realize that he's the one that we're really looking for. But what I'm convinced of is this, is that when I wake up early enough sometimes to hear it, or slow down long enough to pay attention. When I hear them songs singing outside, them birds singing outside, I can tell you right now, they sing in glory to the Lord. Yes. Hey, I'm telling you right now, yeah, you're, a bird brain doesn't have enough brain. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's in their DNA. Just like it's in your DNA in order for you to give worship to the Lord, I'm here to tell you, them birds are singing to the creator of this yes. universe. The trees, when they blow in the wind and you hear the rustle of the leaves, I'm telling you right now, God created it all and it's all to be in harmony to yes. bring praise and glory to God. Yes, amen. And sadly, I know I've said it many times, you might not remember, but somewhere just now, probably a limb just fell in the swamp <laughs> and crashed into the water. That's a sound that God never intended. Because you see, that limb that fell, is it's a description of decay, death, dying, and rot. That's part of the fall. But I'm here to tell you that there's coming a day when God is going to make it all right. Oh, God's going to make it all right. And all creation groans and waits for the redemption of the sons of men. And there's going to be a day when it's all going to be made right. Hallelujah. But in the meantime, you and I have to live in the midst of thorns and thistles. I'm not trying to tell you that God will never allow us to be risen up, that he's not going to give us grace because he will give us grace. I'm not trying to tell you that he won't heal our lives because he's a healer of people's lives. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is that the whole reason he wants to heal your life and the reason he wants to heal my life is so that Jesus can receive the glory. Hallelujah. Not you, not me. He wants to move through you to give Jesus the glory. Why? So that other people can hear. Yes, yes. So that other people can know. Yes. How many times do you even think like just Robert going to a restaurant telling somebody about Jesus? Or you at a gas station telling somebody about Jesus? Or thank God that, that my sister and, and, and that Kathy that were here on Wednesday night, that she told my sister about Jesus. And then my, one day my sister showed up at my mama's house on Normandy Circle when I was 13 years old. And my first response to hearing her say Jesus 12 times in one night was, oh my, wow, she's a Jesus freak. <laughs> But you know what? The Lord knows how to get a hold of folk because I laid in my bed that night and I can remember praying this prayer. I'll never forget that. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you the truth. I said, Lord, I don't know about all that. And I was a pray I prayed. My mom would teach me some Catholic prayers, and I can remember one time I'm like, Lord, I just want to talk to you. I was six years old in Spring, Texas when that happened. I just want to talk to you. I'm like, I don't know about all this. I just want to, I just want you to know I love you. Thirteen years old, seven years later, after all this stuff, my sister shows up and I said, I bet she don't even love you. I'm telling you, I don't know what was wrong with me. I'm just telling you, the devil was trying to lie. I don't know. I don't think she even loves you, Lord. I think she loves the devil. Oh, yeah. I'm just telling you what this little, this little thirteen-year-old head said. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I don't know if you ever heard of sleep paralysis, but it hit me like a mountain. And I was stuck in my bed. And all I could hear was the blood rushing through my ears and my heart beating 150 miles an hour. And I didn't know what to do. I was stricken with fear and like nailed to my bed. And all of a sudden, I just said the same thing that she had been saying all afternoon. And I whispered at you. So I'm like, get out. I was trying to call for my mom, but she was in the other room. It was probably 3 o'clock in the morning. I was trying to say, Mom, at first, I couldn't say that. I was stuck to the bed, and then I just went. Second. It got a little bit louder. Jesus. And then, and then it went. 
Hallelujah. Oh, I wish I could tell you that from 13 on, I just lived for Jesus, but I'm here to tell you it wasn't that way. But hallelujah, he's got a way of getting a hold of us is what I'm trying to tell you. He's got a way of getting in your head and in your heart to get you to get your attention. Amen. And God's got a will on this earth that Jesus would be glorified and that others and their lives would be changed. Amen. Hallelujah. He said, you seek me not because you properly perceived the miracles, but instead because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. People are empty and they're looking for something. But Jesus gives them a little something, something that fills them up. Boy, they're feeling good, boy. Let me do it back from the table, man. This was a good meal, man. He met my need. Then Jesus goes on to say this, labor not for the meat which perishes. You know that word meat there? It's not carne asada. It's not... It's steak fajitas. It, it, the word meat literally means to be food in the key, old King James. Labor not for the food that perishes. See, <coughs> the fish that they ate, if it left, was left alone, uh, uh, alone too long, it was going to decay and start to stink. The bread, if they left it alone, to, it was going to get moldy. Food today will perish. Things that we look towards today are temporal. They're temporary. Right. The car is temporary. The house is temporary. Even our families. Yeah. Don't misunderstand what I'm trying to tell you. Don't say this preacher doesn't believe in family, doesn't love family, doesn't love his children. Doesn't. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. Our families on this earth are in some ways temporary. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say that if them kids are yours or anybody tries to stand in between you and your relationship with Jesus, that's a problem, my friend. Yeah, that's right. Your, your nieces, your nephews, your best friend down the road, your cross the street neighbor, if they standing in between you and your Jesus, your mama, your daddy, your dog, your cat, your bird, your goldfish, if they standing in between you and your Jesus, we got a problem, Houston, and we need to make some change. Amen. Because all that stuff is temporary, but let me tell you something, God is eternal. Now, I'm not trying to tell you to go divorce your wife because she don't want to go to church with you. That's not what I'm saying. But don't let her keep you out the house of the Lord. You stand up, you get a backbone. Amen. Man of God, woman of God, and you say, no, I am a church-going, Jesus-loving, praising and worshiping believer in God, and I'm going to the house of the Lord this morning. And you are so welcome to come if you would like to. I got room for you. Amen. I don't know where that came from. It's, it's the truth. Don't labor for that which perishes. It's temporary. It's going to fade away. It's going to go away. But for the meat which endures unto everlasting life. Now, in the end, I've got to tell you that this whole story, he's going to go into communion in the end. He's going to say, my flesh is true meat. My blood is true drink. I don't have time to get into that. But what he's talking about there is, see, and, and, I, and I don't mean to be rude, but he even explains it for the Catholic Church. Because he says, no, 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 no. The flesh profits nothing. It's the words that I speak. They are, they are spirit and they are life. What he was trying to say is, is that his flesh was going to be given on the cross. His blood was going to be shed on the cross. It's true meat, meaning it's true food. Spiritually speaking, believing on a continual basis in Jesus Christ is the spiritual sustenance that you need. Just as you eat bread or you eat meat, there's all kinds of chemical reactions taking place in the body that's turning that into glucose, which is the form of fuel that the cellular level uses to produce energy. It's called ATP. In a similar fashion, your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross is the very sustenance that you need, the very energy that you need from the Holy Ghost as you put faith in the one that God sent and the work that he did on Calvary's cross. Grace is released into your life and grace is power from God. Grace is strength from God and the energy of the Holy Spirit moving and operating in you and giving you the power that you need to do what God has called you to do. Amen. I hope that makes sense. What is he trying to say? ATP? You don't even need to hold on to that. Just forget I even said that word. What you need to focus on is that Jesus did it, my friend. Hallelujah. It's a done deal. It's a finished work. He said it is finished. Hallelujah. That means, guess what? The enemy don't get the last say so. No, no, no. God has the last say so. And you and I got to learn to fight the good fight of faith. Yes. To believe in that what Jesus did was enough. If he said it is finished, it's good enough for me, my friend. I'm going to believe. Amen. Amen. 
I'm going to believe it with the help from God. I'm not going to believe it on my own. I have not arrived. Amen. He said, he, he, hold on to that meat which endures the everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him has God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, I want you to see this. What shall we do? <laughs> I want you to see that. Because look, number one, I'm, I, I was trying to point out to you that their motives were wrong. They wanted to make him king, but they didn't really want the king that God was giving them right then and there. One more thing that I thought about was this. Do y'all remember the story of, of the children of Israel after the judges? Do y'all remember who the first king of Israel was? Huh? The first king, Saul. That's right. Saul. Saul was the first king. Was that, do you believe that was God's will? I don't believe it was. No. And let me tell you how I know that. I'm going to tell you how I know that. Because, see, many preachers have said, oh, well, if Saul would have been obedient to the... No, 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 no. It was never God's will for Saul to be king. How do you know that? Because if that was the case, then the word of God contradicted itself. What are you talking about? Because God promised that the seed would come from David whenever Jacob laid his hand on Judah and prayed that Judah is aligned well. And he said this, the scepter shall not depart from Judah till Shiloh comes. What is the scepter? The king's staff. It will not depart from the tribe of Judah until the one to whom it belongs is revealed is what that was saying in that prophecy. And so that took place long before David was ever, long before Saul ever showed up. Saul was from Benjamin, not Judah. Anyway, that's a Bible study lesson. That's a Sunday school lesson. But the people said, give us a king. We want a king. We don't, we, we, we don't want no more judges. We want what we want. And see, God was preparing young David as a shepherd boy in a field somewhere. And he was strumming a harp. Come on, somebody, help me out. See, that's another thing I wanted to say about the music group. You need to pray for them because, look, the children of Israel, I didn't plan none of this in my message. The children of Israel, when they would march in the exodus, in the wilderness, they put Judah in front. The word Judah means praise. Yes. Judah is where David came from. Judah <clears throat> is where Jesus came from. David came later from Judah, but you know what he was? He was a worshiper. He wrote the Psalms. The word psalm means song. He learned how to write songs in the field and in, and in the valley. In the field is where he first learned as a teenage boy with his harp in, in the, in playing songs as he was tending sheep. God was preparing his heart as a shepherd. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm the great shepherd. See, a shepherd cares for the sheep. He's different than a hireling. Hirelings run whenever the wolf comes. No, 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 no. David said, oh, no, I killed that lion. I killed that bear. They come after the sheep and Goliath, you're going to fall too. He learned all that in the field. Strumming his heart, writing songs unto the Lord. God was preparing a, a person to be king but the people got ahead of god see many times we get ahead of god yeah. I'm, i mean I, I i just i don't know why i'm on it but oh no i'm about to buy that car okay well now you gotta pay for it friend yeah. and that's all i'm trying to say i mean as long as you can pay for it that's good but if you can't <laughs> you're gonna find a whole new truck oh no we want a king okay well here you go you get your king if you would have just waited a little bit longer i had him prepared for and what I'm trying to say is, is that they didn't learn. They still didn't learn. Have you ever felt like you, you're not learning? <laughs> I don't know about you, but no, I'm talking about the same trial and tribulation happening over and over again. Israel says, give us a king. We demand a king. We want him right now. And then over here, they're like, I'm going to take Jesus by force and make him king. But they don't really want the king that he's come to do. See, this kingly king showed up on a donkey in humility and self-sacrifice to lay his life down. He was born in a manger. He wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't born wearing silky clothes like kings wear. He was born in a manger amongst stinky animals. And he rode into town on a donkey. He's coming again one day on a white horse. Yes. What I'm trying to say is we don't get everything right now, right now, today on this side of glory. Some of that stuff's coming on the other end. God wants to give glory to Jesus today, yes. and he wants people's lives to be changed. Three things that stand out in focus. Hold, before I get to there, look at this. What shall we do? So that was the first thing. They wanted their own will. They wanted their own king the way they wanted him, right? And, and that ought to be relevant to your life today, because I don't know about you, but I feel it all the time in my own life. Many times I want it my way, and when I don't get it my way, I'm not happy. So that's number one. We don't always get it our way. It's supposed to be God's way. Does that make sense? Number two. They said, what shall we do? 
Look, that we might work the works of God. As we transition to Romans 7 over the next couple of weeks, I want you to understand, I'm going to call that the spoke, the stick in the spoke, or the monkey wrench in the machinery. What are you trying to say? Well, whenever I was a teenager and we lived on Normandy Circle, I had a few friends and they were pretty brutal. They were always older than me. I'd be riding my bike and they'd like, ha ha, they, they, and when I wasn't looking, they'd have a broomstick and they'd shove it in my spoke. And the next thing you know, we'd wipe out. We was always trying to hurt each other back then. Don't do that to your friends. That's <laughs> stick in the spoke. The point is, is that it stopped movement really, really fast. <laughs> For a Christian, whenever you and I begin to put our faith in our performance instead of the finished work of the Lord, it's like a stick in the spoke. The Word of God says it frustrates the grace of God. Yeah. It's a law-based Christianity that focuses on our performance. I gotta read more. I gotta go to church more. I gotta get involved in more ministries. I gotta pray longer. I gotta speak in tongues more. All those things Christians do. But it's not supposed to be the object of your faith for God to release grace. No, Amen. the object of your faith is Jesus Christ Amen. and him crucified. It is finished. Yes. That's what allows grace to flow Amen. in the life. And that's what we'll be covering in Romans chapter 7. So number one, their motives were wrong. They desired to make him a king. Number two, their focus was on the temporary, right? Jesus said, don't labor for that which perishes, labor, labor for that which is eternal life. And then their focus was on works. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Look at Jesus' answer. He said unto them, this is the work of God. You ready? This is the work of God, Christian. I know I've already used all my words. I can see I'm losing you. I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you. This is, this is the work of the Lord, right? This is Jesus' words. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he sent. Can, can we say it again? This is the work of the Lord that you believe on him whom he sent. And if you and I will believe on him whom he sent each and every day, in each and every circumstance, I'm telling you right now, something's going to happen supernaturally. The grace of God from the Holy Ghost will be poured into your person and you will be given the strength that you need to make it through one more day, one more hour, one more minute. And I don't mean just barely crawl, crawling through. No, 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 no. I'm talking about being infused with power from on high to get her done, amen, for the kingdom of God. Amen. That your life would be a testimony. To others around you. Praise God. That God would receive the glory. Yes. Amen. Again, their, their motives were all wrong. See, they were servants of Rome. You, you remember if you read the Bible, they were so frustrated with all the tax collectors because those were their own people and those tax collectors extorted them. You know how you always want to try to, somebody sometimes, someone always trying to get a little extra something out of somebody. That's what them tax collectors would do. They were Jews, but they would take extra more than they were supposed to. They just had to pay Caesar what was Caesar's. And so whatever they had left over, they went in their own pocket. And they would extort them. And, they did, but, and, and, and so the children of Israel were living under the tyranny of Rome. And they were getting tired of it. And they were frustrated with it. And you know, there's truth in each and every one of our lives that sometimes we feel that way. When's it going to stop? When's the chaos going to go away? When am I going to get some peace? I'm here to tell you, God will give you the grace that you need. But sometimes you got to get your focus off of that situation and, and, and put it on the Lord. Sometimes it's a test and he's just waiting for you and I to trust him through. And then their focus was on works. Their wants versus God's will. Their needs for temporary instead of the eternal. You know, the word of God says this in Matthew chapter uh, 6. Matthew 6 verse 33. It says this, and I use this scripture a lot because it's so good. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. What were these other things? Clothing and food and concerns about the cares of life. Listen, they're out there. The cares of life are not going to stop. As soon as this one's fixed, tomorrow there will be another. The enemy, God, there's always a plan. God allows the enemy a certain amount of leeway, according to the book of Job, to prepare and to orchestrate a situation and opportunity of faith. And at the same time, the enemy is trying to break down your faith. Jesus told Peter, Simon, Simon, P Satan has asked permission to sift you as wheat. 
But I have prayed that your faith fail not. Whenever you go through things in life, the enemy's plan for your life is to break down your faith and cause you to turn away. But God's will, amen, is that your faith will not be broken, but that instead you will endure the trial and that you will become stronger. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things would be added unto you. God has a will in the kingdom that he is building and he is asking people that are willing to follow his will to join him in its establishment. So would you make him king? Yes. Again, would you, make the, would you make him king in your heart today and in your life? And that's a good question for the preacher. Will I allow him to be king in every moment of every day? Amen? Because if you would, first and foremost on the agenda is this little problem that we call sin. You ready? Yeah, we don't want to talk about sin. Uh, most... most most Christians live in a place where they're like, yeah, but come on, preacher, you keep talking about sin, but I'm not over here looking at internet pornography. I don't, you know, and I ain't picking on no particular person. I'm not, I don't smoke anymore. I don't get drunk in the bar room anymore. I don't, no, 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 well, you know, how that song used to go? Uh, I don't drink, smoke, or chew, and I don't go with girls that do. Well, good for you, your little heart. You know, you've just grown so much in these few years. But guess what? You got something in you. You might have a gossiping tongue. Is it okay if I just talk for real? Yeah. You might have a lying tongue. You might have a gossiping tongue. You might be hurting people behind their back. The Lord put gossip and slander in the same verse as murder. Yeah. That's the word of the Lord. Amen. We all got something that the Lord's working on. Amen. We all got something that the Word's working on. And that's the first step is this problem called sin. Because look, sin prevents us from being able to move forward in the will of God. It, and even if it's not all that, you know, I don't drink, smoke, or chew, and I don't go with girls that do, it might be something else. It might just be my selfishness versus the selflessness of the Lord. That prevents me from being able to move forward because I'm so worried about my own agenda instead of God's agenda that I refuse to take a step in the right direction. It could be that selfishness is saying, but no, I don't have time for the house of God or the will of God because i got to make these things happen in my life in order to get from point A to point B. But if you would have just surrendered your heart to the Lord, if that was God's will for your life, whatever that is, if it was God's will, he would have opened up the door. So I have been poured you out a blessing that you weren't able to contain. But you were so busy in your own strength trying to function and figure it out and to make it happen, you know, to create it for yourself that you never even got it. Come on, somebody. Help me out. Here. Oh, that's the truth. We don't like it sometimes, but that's the truth. So would you make him king? You know that word sin literally in the Greek is hamartia and it means to miss the mark. It's kind of like if you had a bullseye and they hit God's will every time. So God's got a perfect will, but sometimes we, we're getting it in the blue instead of the red, right? It's still not the will of God. I mean, you, you understand, God, God's merciful and he's gracious and he's, he uses our failures and mistakes to, to teach us his ways. But look, it means to miss the mark. And whenever we miss the mark, it affects the kingdom. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Sometimes sin affects us in ways that aren't as easily seen. So real quick, I'm just going to, I'm about to close because I can see, I, I feel like I've, I've kind of gone on and I want to get the main point. Who will be king? And that, this is kind of like a review of where we've been. Let me just show you this, this scripture real quick. Romans chapter 5, verse 21. This is where we started our journey in Romans, that as sin has reigned, you see that word reign right there? That's how I'm connecting this to king. The word reign is the reign of a king. Sin has reigned. You see, <clears throat> from the fall of Adam, even under the law, from the fall of Adam until the advent of Jesus, sin it can reign in people's lives. Even in believers' lives. Sin can still be king if they don't understand how to properly put faith and if they don't surrender to the will of God in areas of their life. Sin can still reign as a king. It's not God's will. But he says that this is the way it's supposed to be. That as sin previously reigned unto death, even so might grace reign. That's a good word right there. Grace wants to be king in your life. Grace is king in your life when Jesus is king in your life. When your faith is in Christ, hallelujah, grace is flows, and now you're living in the kingdom of grace. 
Grace is power from God. How many, I, I know that I've written, I've written this on the board so many times, but the definition for Greek, grace in the Greek dictionary is this. You ready? A divine influence on the heart. What does that mean? What does divine mean? It means God. A divine influence on the heart. What is the heart? The inner man. A divine influence on the inner man and its reflection in the life. That means grace is an inside job. He changes us on the inside and it becomes reflected outwardly. Amen? Amen. Who's going to be king? As sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Then the next, the next thing that we covered in Romans had to do with, and, and that was just a couple of weeks ago, who will you yield your service to? It says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. So as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, servants serve kings. And whenever you and I were bound in sin, what did we do? We yielded our service to this king known as sin. And when the enemy told us to do something that he wanted us to do, what did we do? I don't know what you did, but I know what I did. Okay. I didn't know I was doing that, but I was like, whatever, where's the party? Where's the fun? Let's go do it again, even though it's destroying my life. That's not supposed to be the way that it continues. Once we know the Lord, once we grow in Christ, once we begin to walk with God, we're not supposed to continue to yield our services to the king of sin. We're supposed to yield our services to King Jesus and the result of that is that grace becomes king in our life. And the result of that is that he empowers us to walk a life that brings glory to God. He says, so now yield your members service to righteousness unto holiness. And this is the last thing I wanted to see, wanted you to see before we close this morning. And, uh, and that we'll be building upon as we move forward for the next couple of weeks. He says this. But now we are delivered. This is the Apostle Paul. Now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. How am I connecting all of this? Because, again, the children of Israel wanted what they wanted in a king. And many times in our own lives, we want our own will instead of God's will. And that is the constant struggle of the Christian. Okay, yeah. I'm telling you right now, people in leadership in this church still struggle with that because that's the constant struggle. Yes. That's what Jesus said. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. It's the constant struggle of all human beings. Will you contend with the most high? Will the clay tell the potter how to mold him? So that was the first thing. The second thing was, who's going to be king? Will you yield? Who are you going to yield your service to? And will sin be king? And then the third thing, though, and this is this is the spoken, this is the stick in the spoke. You ready? Law. Look, look. This is what it says right here. I, I want to make sure you understand what I'm trying to say. He says, but look, not only were you and I delivered from sin, that's what Romans six teaches, but we were also delivered from the power of the law. There is a focal point of Christians that are trying to put their faith in their own performance. This is a big thing. How do you know so much, Christian? Because I grew up in, when I got saved when I was 19, this is the majority of what people are preaching. They preach a works-based message that when you're falling short of the glory of God, that what you need to do is you need to do more instead of looking at what Jesus has done and believing that that was enough. And between you and I understanding where to put our faith and then finally surrendering to that, yielding to that, then now that's when grace starts to flow. And we begin to grow. And he begins to change us. And all that takes time. But he wants us to know that we were delivered from this law. We were delivered from this performance-based Christianity. We were delivered from the oldness of the letter. That's talking about the old way of the letter of the law that we're dead to that see we also we're in christ we died to sin but the context here is saying that in christ we also die to the law because there's something in our nature that wants to be recognized for what we do 
Don't you want to be told, come on, somebody help me out. And it's not always, listen, I try to find compliments to tell people like when I'm seeing them, and, I'm, and it's genuine. If I see it, I mean, I hope nobody ever takes me the wrong way, but when I see a young lady and, and she got pretty hair, you know, a little 12-year-old girl, she got pretty hair, I'm like, you got such pretty hair. Yeah. And people, and I don't do that just so that they like me. It's just genuine. People, it, it, you know, I've, I've noticed people say things like that to me before, and, and it wasn't an inappropriate way, and it's like, you know, well, okay, yeah, you know. Because that little girl, Lord, help me. listen, I, yeah, I wish that they really were stopping bullying in school, but it's not true. But anyway, that's another the pet peeve. And so if me just telling this little girl that she's got pretty hair and she's going through something is going to make her feel a little bit better, you know. My point is, is that we all like to be told good things about ourselves. Okay. And we like to be recognized for our performance. Right? And so it's in our nature. So, so the problem is, is that it also will transcend over to our Christian walk. And we will begin to believe because we've got this default position. I'm talking about the law right now. I'm talking about performance-based Christianity. We have a default position, the way the computer screen goes back to the original spot, where we focus on what we do. And we think that in order to please God, we got to do stuff. Does that make sense what I'm saying? I can remember back when I used to be at Walmart, I hadn't been in church for a couple of weeks when I was in nursing school. There's always an excuse, somebody. Oh, there's all, I just don't have time. No, if you you need to make the time. <laughs> and I'd be, oh, yeah. Yeah, where you been, bro? Oh, man, yeah, I know I need to get back in the house of the Lord. You know, looking at, I need to pray more, I need to do, yeah, you need to, we need, people go, the people of God forsake, not the gathering of the brethren. The people of God pray, the people of God read the word. But that's not the problem. The problem is that we're not surrendering to the Lord. The problem is not that we're not believing that what he did on the cross was enough. Amen. And the problem is, is that we're putting our focus of faith on what we do instead of what he did. Amen. And when we do that, we frustrate the grace of God. So not only did we die to sin in Christ, we also does died to the power of the law in our lives. And that's where we're going to go moving forward. We're going to understand a little bit about the stick and the spoke. And how, when we change the object of our faith from what Jesus did... To what we do. And we focus on where we're falling short. It frustrates the grace of God. Because the question that I would have as we close. And music, musicians and singers. If you would come forward. I would like for y'all to close us out. In a, in a song of praise. Amen. We'll leave this house praising the Lord. The way we came in. But you know. You have had to have felt this before in your life. When you felt like the Lord wanted you to read the Bible more, can, can I, you don't have to raise your hand, but surely everyone in this place, the Lord has put something in your heart to give you a desire to read the Bible, more, right? And then you may turn around and you, and you didn't read what you had predetermined for yourself. Maybe you plan on reading two chapters a day, right? And you only, you, you didn't even get to it today. And so what happens? Do you feel bad? You feel con condemnation. You feel beat down, right? My first 12 years of my Christianity, that's what, how it was every day. And then I'm telling you, when I heard the truth of the gospel that told me that Jesus was what I was supposed to be focused on, the next thing you know, I read the whole Bible twice in one year. I read the New Testament seven times and the Proverbs 12 times. It was like I was reading so much, and it was like, and that wasn't even the focus. My focus was Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? And, and I just want to try to make that point, that, that performance-based Christianity frustrates the grace of God. Jesus' performance-based Christianity releases the grace of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord. We're coming to your house. I'm praying that you'd speak truth to our hearts, Lord God, and that we'd get a revelation of these things that are said because it's your word and we need it. Lord, as we worship the Lord together in this song, I pray, Lord God, that you'd minister to every heart. That you'd open the eyes of our hearts, oh Lord God, that we'd be able to see you, Lord. We give you glory and honor, Lord. I pray that you'd be with your church the rest of this week. That you'd give them the grace that they need to live for you and to walk with you, oh Lord God. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.